Glenn Wilson is about to be inaugurated into the Squash Hall of Fame. And I just want to say before anything else, congratulations, mate. It is so well deserved. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, it was a bit of a surprise. Normally I, I, I'd look at something like that. And if you're lucky enough to get the phone call, it's normally at the end of your coaching or playing career, sort of still in the midst of my coaching career. So it was a bit of a shock. Um, but, yeah, I feel very lucky and privileged to be uh, um, to be named in the Squash Hall of Fame for, with Squash New Zealand. Well, I tell you what, you've been incredibly modest because we all know your success and what you've achieved. And just to let the audience know, from the Maidstone Club in Upper Hutt, as my fledgling career was finishing, yours was just starting. And I remember you, I can't, I can't remember the exact age you picked up a racket, but I remember by about the age of 11, you were starting to get really, really good. Yeah, it was actually nine. And I remember those days because... Um, probably been playing a couple of years before man of the you, know, you wipe in the fourth me a few times in those in those days. But that's where it all started. We had a great junior program back there. There was a lot of good guys playing in the Hutt Valley. Um, I got the opportunity to move to Auckland under Darcy Albuquerque, who was a national coach at the time and um, he got me to a, a level uh, where I could compete internationally as a junior. And I I went over and played a couple of tournaments, uh, British Open, um, you know, made the final one year and I, I sort of after that I, I knew I was sort of up there or thereabout so the rest is history really and um, you know one of the first things or the first thing I did when I finished playing my career was just move straight into coaching just because I, you know squash had given me so much it was the only thing I'd ever done probably the only thing I knew and um, I've been doing it ever since and lucky you know luckily enough in the last uh, few years with the Com Games with Joel and Paul on that we've um, we've had some success uh, uh, you know throughout this um, golden era that we're having so no I feel very lucky to be still involved and still being uh, employed um, and uh, yeah looking forward to a few more years obviously in the sport Why squash Glenn why at a young age did you choose that because you were very athletically gifted I mean you're a young strong man and so you could have chosen just about any sport why squash um, well, I played you know a little bit of rugby uh, Prior to that, you know, we uh, you know, back at the Maidstone days, we, you know, you got the squash courts attached to the rugby club there mm, in Upper Hutt. Mm. So, you know, we played it just socially, um, uh, and you know, got quite good at it. Uh, showed quite a lot of interest. I, I think it was, you know, just the individualism of doing something on my own. I ain't had myself to blame. I could work hard at it and get my, you know, and, and get the rewards from it, from what I put into it. Um, which is obviously different from a team game, and I, I, I think I actually preferred that. You know, um, you couldn't get annoyed at anybody, or people couldn't get annoyed at you. You know, yep. when you're playing yep. team sports, and I, th- I thrived at that, and I, you know, really enjoyed the sport. And I had a passion for the sport when I was young, and I, you know, my, my parents didn't have to drag me down to the court. I wanted to be down the courts the whole time. And, and like I said earlier, we had a, a great bunch of guys around there at the time. They all turned into really good friends of mine. And, you know, before I knew it, I was 15, 16, travelling the world, playing international junior events. And, you know, that, that was quite exciting as a young kid, you know, playing rugby back then. You know, we were going to the, going to the Warrior of the Bush and, yes. you know, one million <laughs> places like this. And the squash was taking me to... Not quite as exotic, mate, was it? Me to, yeah, squash was taking me to, you know, to Malaysia and the States. And, yeah, that probably sold it, really, Martin, to be fair. <laughs> you know, there I... Was a, a bigger window that opened for me. I, you know, I, I, when I think back myself, what I loved about it more than anything else was it's one of the very few games that you can practice on your own, and it's actually really easy to practice on your own. You get inside that court, you only need a ball or a couple of balls with one burst. I mean, you don't have to go chasing yeah. anything. It's not like tennis, and it's not hitting against a paddleboard or, or whatever. You could actually seriously train and get really good by yourself. Yeah, well, you've got the front wall in front of you, right? So you, the ball comes straight back to you, or you can hit the ball wherever you like. You can run after it. You can use the angles. You know, um, you know, other racket sports you can't really do that as often or, or at all. You know, you can't chase the ball over a tennis net and go and hit it yourself unless you're unbelievably quick. But that's not going to happen, obviously. No. Um, you know, so and then there's there's a lot of strategy in squash, and I love the strategy about it. Um, you know, I had probably had a little bit of OCD back in those days where I just liked to hit the ball down the wall continuously for, for a long period of time. And, and, and with that, you know, you only get better. Um, but there's just a lot, you know, going on, with, you know, being able to use the side walls and practice different shots. There was just a lot of lot of new things that I found intriguing. And then you put that into a match when you're playing a one-on-one. I was highly competitive as a kid, you know, and then trying to, trying to work out how I could use the walls to beat my opponent, to move them around the court and, yeah, I figured a, a lot of it out quite quite early on, and, and with that came success at, at my age. And, um, yeah, um, 
you know, I was lucky enough that I found something really early that I was really passionate about, and I, I just stuck with it and had people around me that supported me, like my parents and my coaches, and and and. and and um, I, I just went for it, and I've been in the sport ever since. Dan Wilson is with us. He's going to be inaugurated into the Squash Hall of Fame on a Saturday night, three-time national champion. He's played in the British Open, got into the top 25 in the world. And let's go back and absolutely applaud mum and dad because mine were the same. I mean, they took us everywhere, didn't they, mate? I mean, they drove us all around to tournaments. We're playing tournaments every weekend. Without them, in their, their selflessness, how important was that to you? Oh, it was huge. I mean, my, my house, you know, because I I've, I've had a, you know, I had an old, old sister and a younger brother, my younger brother played squash as well, you know, so we had a bit of a squash house, so we had all sorts of people staying with us on weekends, or my, my dad went out and bought a 10-seater van, you know, so he could, you know, truck around all the squash players to the local clubs, and, you know, we, we would go to the Warrapa, or, we'd, you know, we'd go to Palmerston North or, or further up the line with everybody and we'd, we would stay with family and other friends, you know, so it became something that we just got used to the whole time. So it wasn't just about the sport that I really enjoyed. It was about what, what, what mum and dad created for us at a very, very early age. And I, th- I think now with my coaching, the, the way that I've approached, you know, after being a professional is, is the way that, that they took me through that when I was younger about supporting a lot of the coach, uh, a lot of the players that I work with now about not just turning up and coaching them, but, but you know, looking after them when we travel and, and, and you know, spending more time with them and, and just help nurturing and support them through that, which is what mum and dad gave me. And um, that, that's the other side of it that I really love about it. It's not just about turning up and coaching them, uh, you know, at, at an event. Who are your heroes, mate? Was it Stuart? I mean, because we always looked at Stuart Davenport because he was like us. He was tall. He was skinny. He was just this irrepressible kid at the time. And I know Stuart well. And he was just such a brilliant shot player. Obviously, Ross was there as well at the time. Susan was there as well at the time. And they were achieving things that world championships, dominant, best players in the world. But Stewie was for me. I mean, the way he cut the ball, the way he hit the ball, the way he went for the Knicks and everything. Yeah, well, you know, I'm from Wellington, obviously, that's where Stu's from. So, so I used to, you know, watch and, and read about Stu back in those days and follow his career, and he was number three in the world. You know, so, so you know, he had Ross um, up north, um, who was obviously very highly ranked as well. Um, you know, but Stu was the first one that I really started following. But, you know, the thing that did it for me, I think, was when the Hangar and um, Gamal Wood came out and played the Hutt Valley Open. I think I was about 12. And, you know, Jahanga was, a, you know, yeah, still yeah. quite young, but he was a legend already, you know, and he played down at the Mitchell Park Club in the hut there, and I went down. And just standing next to the guy and having my photo taken and just watching him play over the weekend, knowing he was the best player in the world, um, was was amazing. And then I think the following year, I saw him play on TV up at the World Championships in Auckland, and, you know, my, my, um, I still have a lot of those games on tape. Um, wow. You know, they were they were live stream. My my dad taped it just about every game, and I still have those in my my, my bag um, that I pull out every now and again. And um, you know, just watching Jan just roll the field. You know, and Stewie, I think Stewie finished third in that. You know, I think Hedy Jahan finished third in the world that year. But just to see Jahanga just roll through that field, and it was an unbelievable field. Everybody was in it. I think that's what 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 did it for me. I felt like I wanted to be like. You know, like Jahanga. You know, mm-hmm. Not many people people can be like that. And I, you know, I didn't reach that that goal obviously, but it, it sort of was Stewie and Ross. They're trying to beat Jahanga every time they played a tournament. That dragged me along. But you know, Jahanga was the best. So, so just following him, um, you know, was awesome. You know, just sort of like you have your Richie McCalls. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And, You know, um, we, you know, I had I had Ross and Stu, but you know, you, you want to be the number one, right? And, and JK was the number one. So. Glenn, has it changed that much? I know it has, okay? The court's different, the floors are different, the equipment's different, the shoes are different, the scoring's different, but is it still about dominating the tee? Is that what you teach your, all the people that you coach? Yeah, I mean, please everything, but, you know, um, the rackets are lighter, the ball's you know, it's a bit quicker, the courts are a little different. Um, you know, you do a lot more with the ball. You don't always have to be as tight because you're a bit more athletic or quite a bit more athletic these days. You see Paul, you know, running around the court and see what he gets back. Yeah, he's amazing. You know, so there is a lot more movement. It's quite exciting to watch. Um, so, yeah, you know, when I, when I coach, I, you know, I take, take a lot out of what I've seen over the last, even last year or three years. You know, you're always modifying your coaching. You know, it's not just about hitting the ball down the wall because guys are attacking from the back, they're flicking it, they're doing all sorts of things, right? So there's a lot more going on, and, and, and when you're training young kids, it's, um, you know, you've got to be very open with what you're teaching them, and because, you know, they're watching the internet, they're watching Squash Site, 
they're watching all the events. They're, they're trying to practice things as well, you know. So I have a very open coaching method, um, you know, and I have a good relationship with the kids that I that I coach. And we, we just talk about what they want to what they want to learn today or, or over the next month, you know. So a lot of the time, the sessions are actually run by the kids and what they've seen and what they're wanting to try and do. So they're very very open these days. Twenty years ago, I probably would have just you know smacked some balls down the wall and cut mm. the volley and yeah. And short and, and, and not use too much risk, but um, no, very open and um, you know because there's just so many different, so many different styles and people playing different ways. Might sound a really weird question for people listening, but it's not for us because uh, we played at a time where, as I said, the shoes weren't good, the floors weren't as springy and things. And I know a lot of people that played in my era that you know had started getting arthritis. Stewie's back went on them just because of the sheer nature of it. You know, uh, what about yourself in terms of that kind of health? How are your hips, your knees, your ankles? I've, I've been pretty lucky, actually. I mean, one, one, one thing I didn't do, which a lot of my friends have done and they've tried to get me involved, is play master squash post, uh, you know, post playing uh, professionally or at a high level. So I, I haven't jumped into that, um, mainly because, you know, I finished my career with injuries, as, as most of you do. Um, so, you know, and I trained full-time back in those days, you know. So, you know, you, it, it's a tough sport. There's a lot of bending, twisting, turning. So, you know, at my age, I'm... You know, I'm not going to do that at my age without any, you know, conditioning. So, um, I, I, I haven't, I, you know, when I'm on court and I run around a little bit, I haven't. Um, I, I've been pretty lucky the last, uh, the last 20 years, um, so I've stayed away from any major, major injuries. But I, I chose not to play because it's where you're going to hurt yourself. Sure. As a, as a Māori man, um, and you know how, how influential was Susan on you as, as, as well? Because you know, I, I just, you know, it, uh, it frustrates me so much that she does not get. I don't believe the kudos and the credit that she deserves. I mean, winning what eight British Open, well, eight, yeah, it might have been eight British Opens, four World Championships or something, but just being so dominant. And the way she played, she played like a man. She practiced against us boys because you know there were no girls around that could actually compete with her. But she took the sport, to, transcended it to a level, not just in New Zealand, Glenn, but also also yeah. globally. And the fact that she's a Maori woman as well. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky enough when I was starting out to spend some time with Susan, you know, over in. Um uh, Berkshire, I think it was, uh, Buckinghamshire. I actually stayed with her, um, I, think when, I think, on one of my first occasions. I, I, I managed to get down and um, watch her compete in the final, the British Open, when it was at the Wembley Arena. So I was around that a little bit and, um, in my early days. And, um, you know, she was so dominant. You know, I mean, she just moved the ball around so fast. She chopped it in with that packing drop, you know, and she just, um, you know, it wasn't so much out thinking her opponent. She just, pretty much did what Jahanga was doing when, and, and just the pressure was just constant and the girls couldn't, um, you know, they, they, they couldn't hang on in the end and she just did it for a long period of time and it was just unbelievably impressive. But mm. Yeah, I mean, probably because maybe, you know, she spent so much time overseas and maybe she wasn't back as much, you know, and, um, you know, but, you know, I mean, being, being mouldy as well, you know, like, um, you know, it's I resonated with her, you know, so having having her over there when I was there was, was really nice. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I spent most of my life overseas. I only really returned about, you know, seven seven years ago, you know, but, um, you know, it's it, it must have been tough on her. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there were other Māori athletes over there doing really well at the time or, or after that when I was in the UK, like Michael Campbell was in the UK, I was following him a fair bit, you know, so I was resonating with him a little bit, you know, so... You know, you pull your um, you pull your uh, your icons from you know not just people in your own sport, obviously. You know, from 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 other uh, you know other sports as well. You know, so I looked at Michael Campbell uh, quite a lot when he was over in Europe playing and um, just following his career because he was local. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, you talk about the, the goat, right? And <laughs> people talk about Heather Mackay. You know, yeah. but, um, you know, it's a different era. But um, you know, I, I would say you know. From how competitive it was during during that time, you know, I mean, Susan Susan dominated for what was it eight years? Yeah, yeah, it was an incredible amount of time. Um, at a in a very very strong era of squash, I mean, those English girls back then were like, you know, I mean, they would have beaten anybody else, but they, you know, Susan just happened to be in their way. <laughs> Again, I started by saying congratulations. Look, it's a real pleasure, and it's you know I, I love the fact that I have memories of you playing as a kid, and uh, and we're all so very proud of you at the club, and everyone in squash as well of what you achieved. I mean, the great thing was is that you had the talent, you had the ability, but you had the dedication, you had the mental fortitude, you had the right people around you, and you went overseas and you and you, and you nailed it, mate. And so all I can say is you thoroughly deserve the accolades and the applause that you're going to get on Saturday night, and I hope you embrace it and just 
reflect a little bit because this is all about you, pal. You did this. You actually did this. You know, single-mindedness of purpose. I remember that quote from Susan. You had it, you got it, and you thoroughly deserve everything that you're about to achieve. Uh, oh, sorry, get recognised for what you achieved on Saturday. Well done, mate. Uh, thanks very much, Martin. It's been great chatting to you.